I can't lie to you about your chances, but you have my sympathies. As the tagline says, in space, no one can hear you scream. But my neighbours could when I first watched Alien, that's for sure. Released in May 1979 in the US and in September 1979 in the UK, Alien is a sci-fi horror that launched an entire franchise that is still going today with the recent release of Alien Romulus. And whilst I'm on it, here's a very quick review of that film. Well, it started well, had the right unnerving atmosphere, and it took its time to get into the more slasher horror that we've come to expect from these films. It was well paced and there were some really good horror moments in this film but it really did start to fall apart about a third of the way into the film with an over-reliance on callbacks and references. Although this might be a bit of a nitpick, the chestation to chestburster seemed to happen in no time whereas this seemed to take hours if not days in previous films and the final fourth act was just batshit crazy. Overall, it's an okay mid-level alien film but it fails to live up to the much superior original and 1986 sequel. I mean, me personally, I think I prefer Alien 3 over this entry into the series, but I do think it is an improvement on Alien Covenant. I was pretty disappointed with the film after such a good opening third, but it seemed to fall victim to the usual fan service that legacy franchise films seem to be littered with these days. The Alien franchise has seen its ups and downs and I would say that the quality of the storytelling, horror and overall entertainment of the first and second films has never been matched. But we'll get onto Aliens in a future throwback Thursday. Alien 3 is a fascinating film on its own and is one that I will happily go back and watch now and again. I actually do prefer the assembly cut of that film but with Aliens we'll get onto that in a future throwback Thursday. Alien Resurrection just seemed to be like a, well, let's do another Alien film just for money. And it was okay, there are some really good moments in it, but it's not one of those films that I actually get excited to go back and watch. Not as much as the first two and the third one. Although Prometheus did have a lot of good ideas in it, I do think that film and Alien Covenant are ones that I could just do without, to be honest. I first watched Alien as a teenager in 1998, almost 20 years after its original release, when my older brother rented it from the local video shop, and I loved it. I found it to be unnerving yet captivating, terrifying yet exciting, and a film that I have loved going back to watch every now and again. They just simply don't make them like they used to. From the outset, the film feels very unnerving. The opening title sequence with the lack of music and that opening tracking shot through the ship just sets up the tone of the film. From the very beginning, you feel on edge. Even though you know nothing is going to jump out at you from around the next corner, the feeling of that likelihood just seems to linger in the back of your mind. I previously reviewed Jaws and I spoke about how that film used the fear of the unknown to its advantage. Yes, that wasn't the original intention with Jaws, but it really did make Jaws a much more frightening film than maybe it would have been if the shark worked. But here, Alien really does take it to another level. For instance, the claustrophobic sets of the Nostromo coupled with the dim lighting really helps with that unnerving atmosphere because it feels like if there is a monster lurking behind the next corner in the shadows, there is nowhere to run. Although the film is set in the future on a space freighter, the characters feel like real people and altogether grounded. The characters feel three-dimensional with clear conflicts, mostly to do with pay and reward because of the hierarchy of the crew. There is also clear resentment between some of the characters. This is clear with Parker and Brett wanting a bigger share of the payment once they've made their delivery and they make this known to multiple crew members, even hounding Ripley once Captain Dallas is off the ship. There is also further conflict between Lambert and Ripley throughout the film, most notably when Ripley doesn't allow for Dallas and Lambert to bring Kane back on board the ship after he is attacked by the facehugger. The point being is that this shows that there are fractured relationships between some of the characters and they show their emotional sides. When you're stuck in a spaceship with a certain amount of people, it is likely that you're not really going to get on with everybody and this just shows the real human conflicts between the characters. The film does a really good job of setting up the characters before all hell breaks loose. This allows the viewer to get to know them a little bit more before the xenomorph starts to kill them off one by one. And I believe that this helps to increase the horror somewhat. 
When you've got a generic character with not much build-up, you don't really care for them too much when they do fall victim to the film's main threat. There is much more impact with the death of a character that feels three-dimensional as opposed to a cut-and-paste two-dimensional character with no depth that is purely there to be alien fodder. For first-time viewers, it would seem that as Tom Skerrick is top build and is the captain of the crew, his character is the most likely one to survive the ordeal. However, once his character is caught by the alien in the air duct, it's clear that everyone is fair game and that it can be anyone who survives or everyone can be killed off. This is actually very clever because it keeps the viewer in suspense. We don't know who's going to survive. But as we know, Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver, is the one who survives. Yet, she isn't your typical final girl. She comes across as strong, assertive, and takes her duty seriously. This is outlined by the fact that she wouldn't let Lambert and Dallas bring Kane back on board the ship with the facehugger attached to him. In hindsight, she was actually correct to do this, but then there wouldn't be much of a film otherwise, would there? Once things really do start to go south, Ripley is at odds with the remaining members of the crew. In the end, Ripley outsmarts the alien when she blows it out of the airlock. She acts purely on instinct. I feel that Ripley is a very relatable character. To keep herself level-headed during the final encounter with the Xenomorph, she has to sing to herself a psychological crutch to keep herself focused on survival when she's at her most vulnerable. I think it's fair to say that she is not a Mary Sue, as Sean and I have discussed on a previous video. She's got no special abilities or skills, she relies purely on her training and is cool-headed in a crisis. And this is some crisis. This obviously affects her psychologically in the next film. She doesn't get along with her crewmates and she makes errors. She is flawed, emotional, but strong-willed and determined. There is an element of luck with her survival. Once she's placed in command, I believe that you begin to experience the movie through her eyes, and this carries through during the sequels. I really do think that Ripley is a very well-written character, as she is during the next two sequels. And that is also testament to how well she's played by Sigourney Weaver, who pretty much has made the character her own. I can't imagine anyone else playing that role, nor could I imagine the character being recast with a different actor in future sequels. To me, Sigourney Weaver is Ellen Ripley. As for the alien itself, this has to be one of, if not the scariest creatures in all of horror. I mean, the thing is unrelenting, insanely violent and emotionless with a badass defence mechanism with acid for blood, which is a clever way to put the crew on the back foot because they can't just go and simply shoot the thing, even though they don't actually have any guns, just flamethrowers and cattle prods. The design of the alien by H.R. Geiger is incredibly creepy, even more so with the fact that it's got no eyes. The beauty of this film is that the alien changes, grows and evolves. The crew never quite know what they're up against, there are obvious sexual overtones, not only with the creature's design, but also with the creature's actions, as well as the facehuggers. But when you think of the alien, you also have to think about the horribly gruesome way in which the thing comes into existence. The facehuggers force themselves onto Kane, who unwittingly becomes a host for this terrifying creature. It is truly shocking. The scene when the alien finally bursts through Kane's chest never fails to shock me. <laughs> Oh no, not again. Hello, my baby. The alien has a very complex life cycle brought into existence in such a horrific way. It is more like a wasp than say a Klingon from Star Trek. It is purely terrifying with an unrelenting instinct to kill. One of the best things about this film was how ambiguous it was with so many unanswered questions. The fact that we don't know what this thing is, where it came from, and how the company were even aware of it in the first place is pretty scary. When Dallas, Kane and Lambert explore the derelict ship, we see this massive dead creature dubbed the Space Jockey. I mean, what the hell is that thing? The mystery added to the tension of the film. There is so much more going on than we or even the characters in the film can even comprehend. There are horrors out there in the universe that we just cannot imagine. And then Prometheus came along and spoiled all of that. So, um, oh, for fuck's sake. Side note, Prometheus actually was a pretty decent film, but 
I don't think that it should have had anything to do with Alien. I do feel that learning more about the space jockeys and the xenomorphs' origins really does rob us of some of the horror that comes from the intrigue and mystery from Alien. I mean, I don't believe that it actually adds anything positive to it. The best way I can really describe this is like being in a dark room and not being able to see things properly. Your imagination can run away with itself, then the light comes on, you can see that there's nothing to be scared of and the mystery goes away, and with it, the aspect of fear. That's how I describe what Prometheus is to Alien. But one of the most disturbing moments in the whole of the film is when the alien kills Lambert. You don't see the kill, but you do hear it, and my god, it is horrible. You can only imagine what it's doing to her. Even when watching the film again for this review, it still gets me. The fact that you can only imagine the sheer horror really does make it truly disturbing. Alien is a film that I feel still holds up today. Yeah, the effects are dated by today's standards, but that doesn't negatively affect the film at all. If anything, I think it goes in the film's favour. The alien lurks in the shadows and is effectively a man in a suit. If you saw the alien too much, it wouldn't have the horrifying impact that it actually has. Again, the less you see. There are a couple of shots that probably don't hold up too well. I mean, after all, it was released in 1979, but one of which is Ash's head when he's revealed to be an android. It was a great twist because no one would have seen that coming, but this really doesn't look great by today's standards. Although, the CGI for Ian Holmes facing Alien Romulus probably looks worse. The twist before this was that the crew were directed to the planet on purpose by the company, and Ash was directed to bring the organism back to Earth by any means necessary. The crew is expendable. Ripley discovers this to her horror, and it begs the question, how did the company know about the Xenomorph in the first place? More intrigue that just adds to the tension. The musical score by the great Jerry Goldsmith further adds to the atmosphere of this film. It is subtle but builds up tension as the film progresses. There is a chilling undertone to the score. It is my personal opinion that Alien is a masterpiece. On paper, it could have been a rubbish B-movie. Dan O'Bannon's original title, Star Beast, would have been the most B-movie title ever. Alien as a title works excellently. It's ambiguous and unworldly, adding further to the unknown element. Alien is anything but a B-movie. Ridley Scott has directed some amazing films, but I'd have to say that this is probably one of his very best. This film does owe an awful lot to Star Wars, however. 20th Century Fox were more than willing to delve back into the sci-fi genre to further capitalise on that film's success. The film really does take itself seriously, and there are hardly any light-hearted scenes and very little humour, save for a few exchanges between Parker, Brett and some of the crew near the start of the film. It is a slow burner which helps to build the tension. It doesn't start with a bang, but instead it takes its time and slowly gathers pace. The pacing keeps the viewer hanging on a thread. It makes the viewer think that the monster could be hiding around any corner or in any shadow. It is incredibly gripping. Whilst researching for this review, I was surprised to learn that the film was released to a mixed reception. Critic Roger Ebert called the film disappointing compared to Star Wars and Close Encounters. However, years later, he changed his mind and listed it in his greatest movies list. It certainly seems as though Alien was also a slow burner with the critics because opinions changed as time went by. I personally think that this is a truly magnificent film. It holds an 8.5 rating on IMDb and rightfully so. With some horror movies, later rewatches take away from the impact of that horror, because you know what's going to happen, but with Alien, even knowing what's going to happen still takes nothing away. Alien is a true horror classic. Many thanks for watching this Throwback Thursday. I've been Colin from the Critical Cinema Club, and I'll see you next time.